good morning. Thanks so much for being here today. For those that are joining us online, I just want to let you know if you see me looking from side to side today, that's because no one here so, sat in the middle. So <laughs> online folks might be confused why I'm swinging my head so much today. No, um, we, we thank you all for being here, and I thank you, the few, the proud that did sit in these middle seats. There are a few of you here. Thank you for being brave. I don't know why those are so scary. Um, we do want to welcome you here today. I hope that you're excited to worship the Lord today. I hope that you're excited to be here, excited to see what God has in store for us today. If you're visiting with us and you haven't yet had the opportunity to fill out a Connect With Us card, you'll find those in the baskets there in your seats. In your section of chairs, there's going to be a basket, and if in that basket is a Connect With Us card. Fill that out and bring it over here to the kitchen, and we'll have a free gift for you as a thank you for taking the time to fill that out. Also in that basket, you'll find different ways to give. You'll find your, your offering envelopes there. You can give your tithe in an envelope, leave it in the basket, and we'll get it after church. There's also, in most of those, there's a scan to give that you can scan and you can give online if you'd like to give that way. You can also download our app and give through that. And so we thank you for giving and being faithful to give. And um, it's been a relief really through, through all of this that our church has been so faithful in their giving. And we thank you for for your continued faithfulness. Uh, we are going to open with a word of prayer, and this is a time in which you can give your tithes and offerings as well. So let's pray together. Dear Lord, we thank you for this day. I pray that you would be with us today, be with us as we look to your word, as we sing songs of praise, and, and that our praise would be lifting you up, Lord, lifted to you, Lord. I pray that um, you be honored by everything that's said and done. I pray that as we give of our, of our tithes and our offerings, that you'd be honored by our cheerfulness as cheerful givers. Lord, I thank you for allowing us to be together today. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Good morning. Stand if you would, please.
song before Pastor Jason comes. Good morning. What a week it has been. I'll tell you, my phone this week has been ringing off the hook and text messages galore, most of them 
that I forwarded on to Robin Keel. Because we have had more prayer requests this week than just about any week I can remember in recent history. There's lots going on in our church family, lots going on with our church family. Lots of things that a lot of you are dealing with. And I understand that. It can be a hard time right now. It can be easy to get discouraged and to get beat down. And that's before you even look at your phone or turn the news on. And so I understand that we're coming from a place where the world wants us to be discouraged. And I feel that. And as we look at the book of 2 Thessalonians, the Thessalonians felt that too. And I think that when the world begins to beat us down, it can be easy for us to forget some key components of our faith. The Thessalonians, they were facing persecution, false teaching, and other problems within the church. Today, we have our own set of problems. But you know what I think that we all have in common is that whatever problem we're facing, that one's the worst, right? We think that the pandemic that we're in and the difficulties that we face, I mean, I have people ask me all the time, do you think this is the end of the world? I don't know if this is the end of the world. I imagine that the Thessalonians who were being killed for their faith thought this was the end of the world. I imagine that whenever there was false teaching saying that the end had already come, they thought that was the end of the world. We all face things, and it's easy for us to say that whatever we're facing is the worst thing that anyone has ever faced. Because it feels like that sometimes, doesn't it? But Paul, in the book of 2 Thessalonians, gives some pastoral encouragement. And I think that today we could also use some encouragement. And so I want us to think back. If you're a believer, if you're a follower of Christ, I want you to think back on your salvation. Think back to the time that you were saved. For me, I was thinking about the time that I was saved. I was a kid in vacation Bible school. And I might have shared this story before, and if I did, I'm not sorry. It's a good story. It's the story of my salvation, and I will share it over and over again. I was a kid at Vacation Bible School, and my mom and dad had sent me there. They had sent me to another church. It wasn't our church. It was another church. So they sent me, and they told me that I would be on my best behavior. I would go, and I would sit in my seat, and I would not get out of my seat. I would not speak out of turn. And I would be good, and if I was not, whatever punishment you received at school, you received twice when you got home. And if you think you had it bad, my grandma was the school secretary, so there was no hiding anything <laughs> from my mom and dad. So I was at, I was at this Vacation Bible school, and they all had an altar call time. And they presented the gospel, and they said, if you wanted to know more about this, you should come forward. But coming forward meant leaving your seat, which I had explicit instructions not to do. So when I got to class, our teacher's name was Joyce. And I remember specifically that there were three students in our class. Now, Joyce could have been discouraged that her class only had three students in it that night. But instead, she had a one-on-one -on -one conversation with each of us to make sure that we were saved. And I said I was not, but that I wasn't supposed to leave my seat. And she said, do you want to talk more about that? And I said, yes, I do. And she yelled out in the hallway, I need somebody to take my class. I got a kid I need to talk to. 
And we went, and I can still picture the exact spot where we went and sat at the altar and where Joyce led me to the Lord. Joyce went home to be with the Lord this year. And so I didn't think that story was going to upset me like it did. (laughs) But we never know the impact we're going to have. And we never know when we go and we sit down with three kids who are all church kids, and so what's she even doing? Because they're all church kids, right? And she took the time to have that conversation with me. And my life changed that night. And I began to walk with the Lord. And I think that it's easy for us when we get discouraged and when we get beat down and when things are bad and when there is stuff going on that we don't like and the world is the way that the world is, that we forget that we were bound for hell and Christ saved us. And I think that we need to remember that more. We need to remember that Christ died for us. And that's the same encouragement that Paul gives to the Thessalonians. Paul's been talking to them about the Antichrist and the rise of the evil one. And so suddenly he turns with a word of encouragement in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 13. We ought to thank God always for you, brothers and sisters, loved by the Lord, because from the beginning, God has chosen you for salvation through sanctification by the Spirit and through belief in the truth. He called you to this through our gospel so that you might obtain the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. Let's break down this encouragement a little bit. He begins by saying, we ought to thank God always for you, brothers and sisters, loved by the Lord. How often, now be honest with yourselves, how often do you thank the Lord for your church family? How often do you thank the Lord for the people that are sitting right here with you? Because I want you to look at the person on your right, and I want you to look at the person on your left. Some of you did not move your head. You must have really good peripheral vision. I want you to actually look at them. And I'm just going to warn you, today's sermon is going to be interactive. So if you're having problems looking to your right and looking to your left, this is going to be a hard day for you. But all of those people, the person on your right and the person on your left, is loved by the Lord. Every person in this room, and if there were other people in this room, I would say the same thing, but every one of us is loved by the Lord. And we should be thankful for the people that God has called for us to sit next to today. And the people online that are worshiping with us, God loves them. Even though they're not physically in our midst. We've been doing family devotions with our kids, and we've been talking about siblings. The importance of siblings. Why God gives us siblings. But you know what? We're called to be brothers and sisters. We're called to be brothers and sisters in Christ. And there's a reason that that the Scripture uses this imagery. Because we're called to love each other in that way. I remember in the heart of the pandemic when we were not able to meet together like this and people were begging to meet together. And can we please, we need to come together. And we were so thankful to see each other. But now, maybe you're thankful to see some people. 
not so much others. But you see, Paul says he's thankful for the Thessalonians. And then he says, because. And that's important. That's the reason. Because from the beginning, God has chosen you for salvation through sanctification by the Spirit and through belief in the truth. We should be thankful for this body of believers because Christ died for each and every one of us. Christ has drawn us together and built us together as a church because Christ died for us. Christ has called us to salvation and to sanctification. Salvation is that moment I shared with you earlier. That moment in which you accept the forgiveness of the Lord and you are saved. That is your moment of salvation. But sanctification is the process by which we are made holy. We're made holy through the process of being brothers and sisters. We're brought together to help and assist in the process of sanctification. The scripture tells us in Proverbs 27, 17, iron sharpens iron and one person sharpens another. That's what we're called together for. But instead of being thankful for other believers and instead of being thankful for the people that are sitting next to us, too often Christians get the, get the reputation that we talk bad about other Christians or we talk bad about our church or we talk bad about our church family. Now, some of that reputation is earned. It's earned because today you're going to go out to lunch and you're going to talk about this service. And whether you like it or not, people are going to listen. I live in a house with a 10-year-old. There is always someone listening. And so people are always listening. When you go out in public and you talk, people are listening. What reputation are you giving Christians? Is it that you're encouraging, loving, building each other up? Or is it that you're tearing each other down? Because Christ intends that we be an army. And Christ intends that we be iron that sharpens iron. But instead, the army is compromised. Because we don't like the person that we're fighting next to. Here's where we get to the interactive part. Of our service. I thought about doing this all at the end, but I thought, you know, as a pastor, sometimes I'm called to be a coach. And I can lay out all the plays for you, and I can show you where you should go and what you should do. But if we don't do it, then what good is it? Right? I could draw pictures all day long, but if we don't put it into practice, then how are we going to do it? So today I want you to do something that may be a little out of your comfort zone. But I would like you to look around and find someone that you are thankful for. Look to someone that you are thankful for. And in a minute, Debbie is going to come and she's going to play so that there's a little, a little music just to break the, break the ice a little bit. And I'd like you to go to a brother or a sister and tell them, I'm thankful for you. Share with them why you're thankful for them. And thank the Lord for your brothers and sisters that are here. Now, we do have people joining us online. How, what are they supposed to do? How are they supposed to do this? God has enabled us with amazing technology. And if you have the technology to watch this message online, I'm confident you have the, text, the, the, the technology to send a text, make a phone call, do something like that. So during this time, whether you're worshiping with us online or whether you're here in this auditorium, I just want to give you a few minutes to say who you're thankful for. So everybody stand up. Nobody's going to have to be the first that way. And we're going to have a little music as we say who we're thankful for. 
Go ahead. Find someone to be thankful for. shut you down. I could let you go all day, I know. You guys are talkers. But this, we're, you're going to have more opportunities, okay? I promise. This is just the first. So we got to move on. This is hard to do sometimes because I'll try and dive right back into the sermon, okay? But it does, I will say, it does my heart well to see you thankful, as we're supposed to be. And as we see, the scripture tells us that we're to be thankful for our brothers and sisters in Christ. But God has called us all for a purpose. And that purpose is spelled out here in scripture as well. And so it's, it's so that we may obtain the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. Are we showing the glory of our Lord to those that are sitting around us and to those that see us? Or are we allowing the stresses of this world to keep our light hidden? Sometimes the stresses of the world allow us to forget our forgiveness. We forget the forgiveness that we've received. We forget about our salvation. We forget how good God really is. We can't let any of the stresses in our lives, whatever they are, allow us to become distracted from the grace that God has shown us. And the way that we do this is the same way that Paul did it with the Thessalonians. And that is by reminding us to stay in God's word. Verse 15 of that same chapter says, So then, brothers and sisters, stand firm and hold to the traditions you were taught whether by what we said or what we wrote. Now, Paul's use of the word tradition here is many times misused. Because if there's one thing we like in our churches, it's tradition. Right? 
So we can use this scripture right here to say, we've got to follow all the traditions. But that's not what Paul is actually saying. What Paul is saying here is that we have to go back to what was said or what was wrote. What we go back to is God's word. We need to take our traditions and compare them to God's word and ask ourselves, are these traditions God-honoring and godly? Because certainly there are many traditions that are God-honoring and godly traditions. They are not bad simply because they're a tradition, but at the same time they're not good simply because they're a tradition. But we are to take it to God's word and use God's word to measure everything that we do. We need to stand firm on the teaching of God's word. Stand firm and hold on to God's word. That's what we have to do when our world around us right now is telling us it's all up for grabs. Everything in God's word is up for grabs. Everything in God's word is up for interpretation. Everything that's out there is up for grabs. When the world is telling us that, we have to stand firm on the foundation of God's word. There are lots of things that have changed in our world. Think about it. Think about your lifetime. My kids don't believe me when I tell them that I'm older than the internet. <laughs> but it's true. It's true. The internet was born in 1983, so I would say most of us are older than the internet. That's, that, sounds like, that sounds really old, doesn't it? But sometimes things change quickly. Sometimes things change slowly. But the bottom line is, things are always changing. In the last year, we've faced all kinds of change, right? Years before that, we faced all kinds of change. But no matter how much changes, one thing remains the same. Our God does not change. And his word does not change. God's word will weather the test of time. If anyone ever comes at you with the argument that says that you need to change God's word because the, the culture has changed, because time has changed, because it's outdated, because of anything, you can discount their argument right there. Because God's word remains the same. When we begin to compromise on God's word, when we begin to allow change to God's word, then everything begins to crumble. Now, understand, I'm not talking about biblical translation. Certainly, we, we use new words, but the truth remains the same. When we read God's word, it is never outdated. This week, I heard a testimony of a woman, and she set out to prove that God's word was not true. So she set out to prove that God's word was not true. And you know what happened in the end? She became a believer. She became a believer because she set out and studied and looked at God's word. Other scholars, C.S. Lewis, Josh McDowell, Lee Strobel, just to name a few, the list goes on and on. All of these people sat down to methodically prove that God's word was not true. They all ended with a faith in Jesus Christ. Because when we set out and we really examine God's word, we find that it is the most studied and most reliable document in the world. And so when people come to you and they tell you that God's word is outdated or they begin to discount it, I don't think that they've really studied it. Because those that really study and examine God's word find it to be true. 
God's word has an effect on our lives. Studies show that the more we read God's word, the more change there is in our lives. Someone that reads the Bible four times a week is significantly less likely to be depressed, significantly likely, less likely to feel lonely. God's word has a change on our lives if we will study and look to it, if we will study and learn from it. I challenge you, right now when there are times of stress, when times are hard, instead of turning to the, to the myriad of sources, all of the sources that are out there that you can turn to, I encourage you to turn to God's Word. Okay, we're to our next interactive part. You all have been wondering, wondering, wondering what those little blue tickets in your seats are. One of you has an X and you win a million. No. Um, those right there, those little tickets, it says on there at the top, a scripture of encouragement. But then it's blank. In your baskets, there are extra pins today. If you want one, take it home. Yes, they're nice pins. So there's some extra pins in your baskets today. You can look it up in your Bible. If you want to look it up on your smartphone, Google what's a good scripture of encouragement. I want you to write down, I don't care if you write down the reference, if you write down the whole scripture, if you write down some words of it, maybe it's a scripture you know from memory, maybe it's one you need to look up. Jot that down on that piece of paper. This time, you don't get to talk. You just find someone and you give them a scripture of encouragement. So that's what you're going to do this time. Debbie's going to play us some music again, and I'll give you some time to find the scripture of encouragement that you need, jot it down, find someone, and give it to them. Go ahead.
know some of you are done and some of you aren't. If you want to keep working on this project, you can do it now. You can do it later. If you want to take, there's extra blue cards out there. So grab them, take them, give them to somebody, whatever, whatever you want to do. The problem we face when we forget our forgiveness, when we fail to find the encouragement from God's word, is that we lose the security of our salvation. And so Paul spoke to the Thessalonians about this as well beginning at verse 16, and we'll go into chapter 3. May our Lord Jesus Christ himself and God our Father, who has loved us and given us eternal encouragement and good hope by grace, encourage your hearts and strengthen you in every good work and word. In addition, brothers and sisters, pray for us that the word of the Lord may spread rapidly and be honored, just as it was with you and that we may be delivered from wicked and evil people. For not all have faith, but the Lord is faithful. He will strengthen you and guard you from the evil one. We have confidence in the Lord about you, that you are doing and will continue to do what we command. May the Lord direct your hearts to God's love and Christ's endurance. Confidence in the Lord. We have confidence in the Lord. That one of the things that I've been struggling with lately is confidence. Confidence not in my salvation or confidence in Because there are so many decisions that have to be made on a regular basis. And it's been, I don't know, 740 years we've been in COVID now. I don't know. A year and a half, approaching two years. And I have the fatigue that a lot of people have. And I, I had used the words that my confidence had been shaken. And as I read this scripture, I thought, no, I may not be sure about some decisions, but my confidence comes from the Lord. So it's not fair to say my confidence is shaken because my confidence remains in the Lord. I am confident that our church will continue to follow the Lord whether we have Sunday school or we don't have Sunday school, whether we have children's church or we don't have children's church. Whatever we do, I am confident that whatever comes our way, we will stand shoulder to shoulder and follow the Lord. Paul says that the Lord will strengthen them and the Lord will guard them. You know what I like about that? It's not our responsibility. We're to encourage each other. We're to build each other up. But it is the Lord who will strengthen us and the Lord who will guard us. It's easy when your phone is blowing up with text messages from the brothers and sisters that you love and care for and you know that they're hurting to feel beat down. But the Lord protects and the Lord guards. The Lord strengthens us. I can have assurance and confidence no matter what comes our way, no matter how dark the world gets because we have eternal encouragement. Whatever you have faced recently, because I know, I know your hearts, I know your struggles, that each and every one of us is facing something different. Whatever you're facing, embrace eternal encouragement. Because in the light of eternity, what we're facing and what we're struggling with 
becomes clear. We take what we're, what we're struggling with and we hold it up to the sacrifice of Christ. And we realize that in eternity we find our hope. When things seem to, as they have for the Thessalonians, gone from bad to worse, we turn to our Lord and see that he has an eternal plan and allow the light of eternity to shine into those dark places. This should encourage our hearts. It encourages my heart to see you all interacting as we have today. To see you thankful for one another. To see you diving into God's word and looking for the perfect scripture that your brother or sister may need as a word of encouragement. The thing is that whoever we encounter, wherever we encounter them, Every person that we see, Jesus Christ died for them. Can we share the same encouragement that we've shared with those that are here today with others outside of here? Can we look at them and know that Christ died for them and encourage them? Because no matter where we've been, no matter what we've done, God loves us. God loves each and every one of us. And I think especially some of us that may be far from our salvation, we lose the reminder that God loves us even while we were still sinners. Christ died for us. When you encounter someone today even while they are still sinners, Christ died for them. May we share the love that we share with each other, with those that we encounter that are lost and that are hopeless and that are seeking the Lord that loves them. The enduring love of the Lord reminds us that we are to encourage one another. We're to, Scripture says, spur one another on to love and good deeds. So, for our third bit of interaction today. Not your last. You're not done yet. For our third bit of interaction today. You've said thank you. You've shared an encouraging Scripture. I want you to find someone that you think has really been through it and encourage them. Now, don't be insulted if someone comes to you. <laughs> but find someone that needs someone to stand next to them. Find someone that needs that helping hand. Find someone that needs the shoulder that you have. Find someone and encourage them today. Everyone stand if you would. Share a word of encouragement with the brothers and sisters.
we all have so much to be thankful for. We all can encourage one another. Today, we've said thank you to our brothers and sisters. We've shared scripture with them. We've encouraged one another. But there's something else Paul talks about in this scripture that we read. He says, will you pray for us? As he prays for them, he asks that they pray for him. And so today we're going to pray together. And that's going to be our final act of interaction. Is that we're going to pray together. And so I am going to ask that we're going to have to end our online service. And we thank our online folks for joining in with us. But this is going to be the end today as we discuss some very specific prayer requests. And I don't have permission to share them online. So pray together in your home. And thanks for joining us. But I am going to ask those of us that are here today.